Good morning, everybody. Glad you're here with us today. Uh, my name is Mike Murata, and I'm the director of the Assistive Technology Advocacy Center in New Jersey, uh, New Jersey's federally funded AT Act project. I'm excited to host this webinar today, and I'm even more excited because I can just sit and learn. Uh, I'm going to zoom out in a second and close myself, um, but I wanted to pop in and say hi to you. Um, we are recording, and I said this before we started, but just we're recording. There are live captions available along the bottom for people that just joined us. So please make sure you use those if you need them or prefer. Uh, and there are the Google slide captions as well. And I think that's the end of my housekeeping. So without further ado, ladies, please, it's yours. Enjoy. All right, waiting for him to go all the way out. Um, as Judy said, uh, before we started recording, we are very excited to be able to um, spend this hour kind of chatting with you. Um, talking about ergonomics in a distance working and learning world. Uh, my name is Alyssa Wern. I am an occupational therapist that uh, live in Gainesville, Florida. You'll see my contact information and my Twitter handle on the slide. And I am delighted to have my co-presenter with me and I'll let her introduce herself. So I'm Judy Schoonover. I'm an occupational therapist from Sterling, Virginia. And we're so thrilled that you are here today. All right, we're going to dive in just a little bit more about me. Super exciting stuff on the slide. Um, um, biggest and most important, you know, I, I kind of come from the University of Florida area. I've got my master's in special education and I do have my ResNet ATP. I'm a dog mom. I apologize if my dog uh, barks in the middle of this um, and have an amazing niece and nephew and Judy. I've been interested in this topic for a long time, so I'm not going to talk about me. Um, I was sharing with Alyssa and with Mike uh, previously. Uh, years ago, I got in trouble with my school district because I actually contacted OSHA about the fact that all the blueprints for the new schools had computer desks that were built into the wall. And I've been concerned about the way we position ourselves for, for a long, long time. So. Uh, as I've participated in chats and town halls in recent weeks, I've seen a lot of people seem uncomfortable. We've heard, both Alyssa and I have heard a lot of people complaining about neck and back pain, and this seemed to be a perfect time to be voluntold that we would be doing this. So the topics on the next slide for this section are, what is ergonomics? Um, the common problems and some of the solutions, some case studies, and additional resources. And as you can see by the gentleman sitting there, um, I'm sure a lot of you have similar positions. I also want to point out how comfortable he might be in terms of his clothes. There's been a lot of stuff about, um, you know, uh, wearing sweatpants for, for weeks at a time, um, sleepy down low or whatever. Um, we have given ourselves a lot of permission to um, treat our tactile system a lot better, but I'm not sure that we've given our musculoskeletal system the same permission. And so this is what our focus is today. So um, just a reminder, uh, this will also be in the slide in the end. Um, I have kind of uh, curated a Wakelet. If you're not familiar with Wakelet, it's kind of like a Padlet and Pinterest had a baby. Um, it's kind of a great curation of resources. And again, um, you'll have a copy of these slides and the, um, the link is again at the end. Um, and so don't stress about trying to capture a link or a specific resource because that and more are in the Wakelet. Um, so this is a very short little video that I'm hoping the internet is friendly and will work for you. And watch carefully because there's going to be a quiz. <laughs>
chat um yes i think everyone kind of sat up a little straighter in their chair and thought oh you know i kind of wish the uh the uh, the the cameras were on i'm sure everybody adjusted their position a little bit but i like that video because i think not only is it adult friendly give us some cues but it's also um student friendly um to share with them about little things that they could try and that's kind of what we're gonna dive into so wouldn't it be nice if it were that easy as the film yes, uh, that you just saw? We just push a little button, move a little hand, and we get all adjusted, but it doesn't quite work like that. So the term ergonomics is taken from the Greek word work and um, also natural law. And it's the science of designing jobs, products, and places to fit the worker, not the other way around. And in these days, we are really doing a lot of retrofitting. Um, we are um, dealing with the hand that's been dealt with us. So we are creating workspaces where they weren't normally um, created. And we are using furniture that isn't necessarily designed for the job. So uh, one size does not fit all, but I'm sure that this is a very familiar setting for a number of you that are um, working at home and have other family members who may be working. As you can see, we have four people gathered around the table. They are all at work, but they are all in different positions and none of them is really ergonomically friendly. So what does your workspace look like? Do you have a dedicated one? And as you can see on the workspace on the left, it is a shared workspace. The cat is having a nice little nap. Um, there are some gathered things, but there's also some gathered obstacles. Um, the workspace on the right, thank you, Mike Murata, is probably a little bit more planned out. And Mike has had a lot of experience because I think he is doing a lot of work from home as well as from other locations. But if you look at his workspace and it not the model for everyone, but it's the model for him. You can see that many things are gathered, so he's not going to be jumping around and, um, and changing positions a lot to get what he needs. He's got it all in one um, area, and it's a very proactive approach. So the great thing about that picture is Mike didn't even know we were going to use it as the good example. Um, so um, a, re a little bit about why is it important? Why does ergonomics matter other than, you know, we want to make sure we have the best workspace station for us. So this is statistics, it's numbers. Um, and if you take a glance at this chart that's here, um, it is looking at injuries and illnesses by industry. So the type of work that you do for 2018 to 2019. Um, and the third, the, the three big bars are manufacturing, healthcare, and social assistance, and then, ding, 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 education and health services. So it uh, looks like it's kind of a tie between manufacturing and education and health services. Um, and, and so it's, there's some data to back up the fact that our industry, the work that we do, um, is, is a cause for a chunk of the illnesses that are out there. Oops, long, wrong way. Um, one other piece and probably the most common illness 
that um, is, is most prevalent in terms of our industry is carpal tunnel. So this bar graph um, kind of illustrates both current prevalence, um, and this data is from 2015, but current prevalence, um, anybody who's ever reported a prevalence of carpal tunnel syndrome in our industry and those that attribute it to work. So it's not just a, uh, we think we have a problem, it's there is an actual problem happening. Um, the, the background to why a specific um, a problem may occur is kind of rooted in these three areas that you see on the screen. So uh, we're gonna dive a little bit deeper into the three kind of causes, but you're gonna hear me kind of talk about MSD. MSD is a muscular skeletal disorder. So anything that's wrong with your muscles or your bones kind of as a result of these three factors, specifically looking at force, your posture, and repetition, okay? So when we break down these risk factors, um, most anything we're doing, any task we're doing, requires a certain amount of force, right? You can't move a something without applying force to it. Um, we know that means that you're going to increase the muscle energy, right? We know that with increased muscle effort or energy, you're going to have fatigue, right? Um, and that's going to lead to some muscular skeletal disorders. We know that. Repetition is probably the biggest factor that also um, plays into that carpal tunnel among other injuries, right? So most of our work tasks are repetitive in nature. And any task repetition that is, repetition is basically anything that occurs in a 30 second period, if nothing happens again in that 30 second period. So many of our tasks are, are more than 30 seconds. We're not gonna type and go, oh, my 30 second timer went off. I don't want this to be repetitive. Um, so being able to know that you know, all of those tasks, the rep rep repetition's a part of, a feature of this, absolutely. Um, and you can't totally take away a repetitious task, but we need to make sure we're accounting for it in the best ways that we can. That last kind of risk factor is posture, okay? So we know we've seen a lot of awkward postures. Um, the, the Zoom lean, you know, when you see people kind of leaning in closer on their screen, um, that Zoom lean is an incredibly awkward posture. It's not something that we would put into place in our normal life and think is normal, right? Our joints are made to be the most efficient in the middle range of the movement, right? So when you extend your arm all the way out, right, you know, you're at the end of that elbow range of motion, all right? So that's when we're likely to get in some kind of awkward posture, all right? And awkward is not the middle range, all right? When we're in an awkward posture, we're not in that most efficient, effective zone. Our risk is repeated when we continually work outside of that zone, okay? So ultimately the goal is that we're completing a task with less discomfort, I can't say we're gonna get you to no discomfort, but less discomfort. Uh, Mike, I think we got somebody annotating slides on top of us. Um, and that we have some proactive strategies for you to be able to assist our work area, um, to, be, to be more successful in that balance. Um, we, want, we wanna make sure uh, issues and things that we can help solve um, that we're able to do that um, to give you a little bit more successful and hopefully it is it is timely advice. So in the big picture, it's not like we can stop working, right? We can't just say, oh, our setups aren't ergonomic, therefore we're just not gonna, we're not gonna make sure, you know, we're, we're just gonna stop working, no more Zoom meetings. Um, our role and our hope is that we can help you control what you can. You know, anybody who's done any kind of experiment, you know, it's, it, we want to control the variables that we can because we know we cannot control everything, okay? Um, things we can't control, 
All right, I can't control what's on your task list. I'd love it if I had a magic wand, but I don't. I can't control what meetings get scheduled for you. That happens all the time. I can't control who else is at home that you might need to support, all right? I can't control what the weather is like where you are and whether you can take a break out there. And I absolutely cannot control when normal's gonna return, okay? Things we can help you to see your role in controlling. Absolutely planning ahead to the extent that we were all kind of tossed into this situation. Um, the planning ahead from day to day about your workstation, including the chair you might use, your keyboard or mouse, how your desk is set up, how your monitor is set up, the lighting that's around you, the things you have access to around you, and helping you see the small ways that you can control your lifestyle and, and stress level. Well, according to the chat, Gary can control everything. Good for you, Gary. But for the rest of you, we're gonna take a stretch break now. So I want you to join me in singing Head, Shoulders, Knees, and Toes. This is multi-sensory, guys. Ready? Head, shoulders, knees, and toes, knees, and toes. Head, shoulders, knees, and toes, knees, and toes. Eyes, and ears, and mouth, and nose. Head, shoulders, knees, and toes. Now, I am going to be selling the CD um, after the presentation, but I want to think, you all to think about the fact that we really do have to address our head, our shoulders, our knees, our toes, even our eyes because of eye strain, our ears because of ambient noise, our mouths because if we don't refresh ourselves with breaks and hydration, we're gonna be in trouble. Nose, I'm not so sure about unless we're testing to see if we can still smell. But we could also substitute the eyes and ears and mouth and nose with forearms, wrists, hands and fingers because those are the other things that we're gonna talk about. So Alyssa's gonna start with discussing seating because that's kind of where we need to begin. And, and it really is very important that First and foremost, we get you in the best seat possible. We know it's not likely that everybody can run out and buy the $500 to $1,000 you know, ergonomic chair, nor is that our suggestion right now. Our suggestion is let's use what you have and jump in and see how we can help kind of support the seat that you're in to support you the best, okay? So this is a little graphic I use sometimes when I am, am doing some training, really we want to see that as much as possible your core has support. So your shoulders, your back, your hip, your legs have the maximum amount of support so that your little muscles, your arms and your hands can do the job that they need to do. Okay, um, and, and that's in, in therapy we talk about proximal stability so that the things close, of you, close to you have stability meaning that you're then your distal end, your hands, your feet, your whatever, can do the job of moving that mobility that we want them to be able to do, okay? So we're really gonna start with the seat, all right? If you are looking for a seat in your house, the seat that is best to use is the one that is the most highly adaptable with as many ways as possible to adjust it, all right? The more adjustable a chair or a positioning agent is, the better position you're gonna be able to put yourself in, right? But that being said, the tasks we do throughout a day, it's not one seated posture to maintain for an entire day. No one should be staying in the same position all day, every day. So just even if you had the most perfect, ergonomic, adaptable chair, you're still not supposed to be in it 20 hours a day. So making sure that we have options, including maybe even multiple options for you to work from, okay? A good ergonomic chair has as many controls as you see in this image. We all know that that's not reality for a lot of people, right? So we wanna make sure that we give you some tips in the meantime, if you are looking for a chair, know that there are some out there that have this many knobs and controllers. 
Fortunately, most of them have little labels on them about what they do, all right? But if you're looking for a chair around your house, look for something that has some armrests that you could make some adjustments to and that has a backrest. So we're gonna kind of jump in a little bit and talk about now that we've talked about some good prime seating, what, uh, what can we do to help our aching backs, Judy? Well, we can start by that seat or that standing position that gives us the support that we need. So when working in a chair or a sofa without, with a sofa without enough back support, try using a rolled up towel, cushion, pool noodle, you can even use a three wing ring binder in schools. We used to have our kids put their backpacks behind them. Something that's gonna support that lower back because that's where, again, I think a lot of people are experiencing the most discomfort, especially when we do the Zoom lean. Um, I'm gonna pull out my cushion. I have a cushion behind my back so that I can sit comfortably, even slightly reclined as I work and as I view my screen so that I'm not uh, putting a lot of stress on my neck and my shoulders. Oh, um, you don't have to go back a lot. Um, just, we have a lot of resources in the Wakelet and um, I just wanna point out that one of them, UCLA has some really great single page tip sheets that you get a chance to take a look at. They'd be great to send to parents, but it even tells you how to roll the towel so it's the right kind of width and it's the right kind of density to give um, our backs that support that we need. Okay, I'm next. I'm ready for the next slide. Please. All right, I jumped in. Go for it. Okay, so um, I, we've already seen in the chat um, that some people have noticed that maybe they need to have something under their feet. When the feet dangle unsupported, the load of the upper body and arms is shifted onto hips, core, and lower back. So there's a lot of things around your house you could use. You can use. Um, uh, uh, Xerox box lid covers, you can use stacked books. It really doesn't matter, but you just want to give your feet a little stability. And um, what doesn't come out clearly in, in what we're discussing today is sometimes you don't need to have your feet like together, um, but kind of displaced a little bit. So it gives you that uh, dynamic shift that we need to be comfortable. You can adjust your seat height so the thighs are parallel to the floor. Um, and knees should be level or slightly below hips. It's okay to, to be a little bit more than 90 degrees. Um, and the seat cushions can raise you up. You can put, again, um, a rolled towel, you can put uh, couch cushions or whatever. Um, you also wanna fully engage or build up your backrest with pillows. Uh, sometimes I think we start a little low and then we don't support our upper back or we'll put a pillow behind our head and that pushes our, our um, our head forward, which causes a, a strain on the neck. Um, if your chair has armrests, you wanna adjust them so the height is below the bottom of the elbows. Um, if they're in the way or can't be adjusted, just take them off or use a chair without armrests. So this is just a, a nice infographic of sitting at work. I'm not gonna go over it too much because I think you can look at it at your leisure. It just, again, reinforces the positions that we're trying to, um, to talk about a little bit more and to help you observe in your own sitting position. So sitting at home might look like this and just, uh, just take a look and, and pitch in with the chat. What do, you guys, what do you all see with this gentleman's neck? What do you see with his shoulders and his upper back? What do you see with his elbows? They're splayed kind of apart. Where do you see his monitor? And do you feel that that's a comfortable position right now? Um, yes, indeed. Uh, Bill, he's looking down and that's a big no-no. Um, and uh, Mary is saying his neck might feel like hers. We see the, the curved shoulder. Um, and then again, the elbows doesn't really give you a real good impression, but the wider apart your elbows are from your body, the less proximal stability you are. So we're gonna take a look at the next slide. And these sources are from Colorado State. These are not my photos, but I'm very grateful for the materials that are already online. A lot of the searching that we did um, were specifically for COVID ergonomic suggestions because um, a lot of the other ergonomic suggestions kind of market some furniture, but we were looking for the suggestions that um, have to do with making do. So if you look at this picture now, 
um, you can notice a lot of differences in how he's positioned. And it's all been done with the existing furniture he had. You can see that um, he's sitting slightly reclined. See his hips, uh, his back is a little bit uh, tilted back, but he's got a, a lower back support. He's raised up his chair height by putting a cushion underneath. He's got his monitor raised up so it's at eye level, and he's probably using um, a portable keyboard. So, um, and there are, is the comment that he may need a higher chair, okay? Um, so you can get some ideas from what you can see there of the, the simple fixes you can make. And then again, it's going to be personal in nature as well as to exactly the kind of height that you need. Next slide. Right, because I know not everybody has boxes of apple juice and uh, treetop applesauce sitting at home that they can use, but some of them could actually. Um, so, but if you do have the option to switch positions during the day, there are options. Some of which would, which would be things that you might purchase, you might have around the house already. Um, some people like kneeling chairs, um, which is what's pictured on the right hand side. Um, it definitely gives you a different working position to be in. Um, some of you have um, balls that you use maybe to exercise, those big yoga balls. Um, I will pull my desk chair away sometimes in the afternoon and bring in the big exercise ball and just give myself a positional break. Um, they make wobble stools and wobble seats you could use. You probably have some stools around the house that you could utilize. Um, I also will take my laptop and stand at my countertop. Just give myself an option to stand for a while. I don't have a standing desk and I don't have the money to purchase a standing desk, but I, I do have a countertop and I didn't have to pay any more for it. It came with the house. So I utilize those things that are available to be able to switch positions. So we're going to transition a little bit to talking about those monitor positions and your eyes, your poor eyes that I know are, are dying from uh, all of the time on computer. So one of the things we know is that optimal positioning is not what we see our friend on the far left doing, right? That zoom lean with uh, kind of your monitor, your monitor and your eyes being very, very close, right? So being able to creatively find ways to alter your position. Now in this case, she just had to sit back upright and adjust her chair a little and move her, her monitor up. Um, there are a lot of ways to make those monitor adaptations. On the right hand side, you see somebody who created his own standing desk at that countertop, right? Good old Cheerios box. Um, and, you know, the, the, uh, the distance then between his monitor on his laptop and his eyes um, is very optimal for what we would need to work. And he's giving himself a position break from sitting. Um, definitely making sure that. Um, that we're, we're having ourselves be on the, the, in the best position that we can possibly be um, for our eyes and our head and our neck, all right? Um, we know that the screen angle matters, not just the height, right? Um, you know, being able to have that screen angled like you see in this picture so that, um, so that as you're looking at things, you're not getting that glare um, and you're not getting um, you know, you're not getting the, the bounce off of other pictures that might be in your house. Um, and you can get it adjusted to what your specific, you know, vision um, needs are. Um, and I do kind of want to toss out there making sure, you know, you think about this when you think about other devices, an iPad that you might be using, or that a lot of our kids who are using AAC devices, how they're, they're glare magnets. You know, how often do we adjust the position of that iPad um, or do we not give kids a credit for making the correct suggestion? Maybe it's that they couldn't see what was on there because of glare. I know oftentimes I'll catch glare on my iPad and have to go, oh, wait, 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 I need to make sure that, um, that we get it in a great position. Because if you can't see it well, we know you're not going to be able to use it well, all right? So we want you to, um, to think about avoiding eye fatigue. You're gonna want to look away from the monitor and focus in the distance, rest and refocus frequently, even covering your eyes with your palms for 15 seconds. So on the next slide, we're going to practice the 20-20 rule. 
So the 2020 rule is to reduce the effects of digital eye strain. So we're gonna all take a break from our monitors for 20 seconds, and we're going to choose something to look at 20 feet away. Some of you are in very close space, we understand, and may not be able to see anything from 20 feet away. But if you can try to do that, and we're gonna go ahead and count down for 20 seconds. That's about 20 seconds, and you should really be doing this about every 20 minutes, um, because otherwise you're going to end up with, with a lot of problems with your eye strain, and we want you to take care of yourselves. This poster is um, available on the Wakelet, and we'll go on to the next slide. And as Kathy shared, if you are in a room where it's close, closed in, you can kind of close your eyes and think about some, you know, imagine something, you know, far away, like you're looking at a beach scene, you're looking at the horizon. Um, that definitely can, can account, you know, I know my office is pretty small, so I couldn't have gotten 20 feet away and seen something, but that, that's a great uh, example of another way that you could do that as well. And we just also want to reinforce, and we've tried to model this and explain it while we're doing it. This is what you can be doing when you're working with your um, with your folks um, online. Um, the kind of coaching that you can do by narrating. Oh, you know what? My eyes are a little sore. I'm going to take a little break now. I'm going to count down 20 seconds. All that modeling just kind of embeds that information without preaching. Um, so. Uh, it, it might be a benefit to everybody if you could just kind of narrate what you're doing and remember to set those breaks um, during your own sessions. Uh, reducing monitor glare can be accomplished both externally and internally. Eliza's, Alyssa's going to talk a little bit about the internal, but for the external, you can dim your overhead lights. Um, you can even put, my husband set, set me up, he was very invested in this, set me up with putting little sheets of paper over the lights too so they didn't glare as much. You can locate your workstation beside the windows and overhead lightings, not in front, behind, or directly below. And boy, I've made that zoom mistake of having the light behind me so nobody can see anything but my shadow. Um, angle the monitor away from the light. Use dark curtains or blinds to cover the windows. Uh, avoid fluorescent lighting if you can, or, or you even uh, put a little filter or a uh, fabric, but be very careful about uh, fire hazards. Um, and cover your monitor with an anti-glare screen, or even make a little tent out of a couple file folders. Oh, and Kathy's got some good information on the chat. If you guys don't have your chat turned out, I'm just going to uh, read Kathy's comment. The lighting in the room should be at least one third less than the light coming in from the screen then add a small lamp for papers on your desk. Thank you, Kathy. All right, so we talked a little bit about um, that monitor, um, that monitor glare and other things that we can do to adopt it. So um, there actually is a diagnosis called computer vision syndrome. It's a real thing. There's a link down on the bottom from AOA, um, if you don't believe me. Um, so we know a lot of you are probably um, experiencing eye strain, headaches, blurred vision, dry eyes, neck and shoulder pain for sure. Um, and we know a lot of those symptoms are due to kind of how we've shifted our work life um, to, to accommodate for needing all of these meetings and are things that um, can, can, definitely, um, can definitely be caused by poor lighting, that glare, making sure you're, you know, you're in the wrong distance, you've got a bad posture, if your vision, you know, you have an uncorrected vision issue for sure, and or um, absolutely a combination of these factors, which I know for me is, is definitely more the case. Um, this slide has a really great graphic of ways that you can combat CVS. So being able to look at quick things that you could do, again, adjusting the lighting, making sure you're wearing glasses if you need to, um, making sure we're following that 2020 rule, um, and, and adjusting when you do need, when you are feeling like you've got some eye strain happening, um, making sure that we, we work to adjust and control, again, control the things that we can, knowing we can't control everything. 
Um, a few resources in terms of eye strain, and I know there are a bunch out there, um, but um, Night Shift is one extension that will help automatically adjust and do some um, uh, adjustments to the text, uh, laying on that kind of color overlay like we talked about. Um, and that, again, there are a few out there. This one is very easy to use. You can make a lot of adjustments to it in terms of when you have it come on, the schedule, and what colors you use. It's a nice, um, the nice um, extension. Um, I did want to mention, because I know I caught myself doing this very early on, um, knowing about ease of access and accessibility things in operating systems and remembering to use them yourself are two very, very different things. So how many times have we recommended to a student or a staff member maybe to make some adjustments to the cursor, use magnification later in the day, maybe when your eyes are a little more tired or use contrast or change that background on the document you're working in. I am incredibly guilty in the first couple of weeks of not remembering to do these things, um, which we, we know are available in operating systems. Um, and we, we do make sure we, uh, we adjust for students, but sometimes we forget for us. Um, just like with Windows, same holds true for Mac options. There are obviously more options in all of these operating systems than I'm kind of highlighting. Um, but the one that I love the most on, um, on the Mac operating system is called Hover Text. Um, and the link for OS support takes you there, but it allows you to kind of like pop out text and have it appear larger for you on the screen. Um, it's a great, uh, great end of day resource for me um, if I'm trying to get through a document. iOS options, as we kind of talked about before, attending to the glare, but also making sure that you're utilizing those things that are built in to adjust the display, to adjust the colors, um, and even from a, a, a reducing kind of keystrokes or mousing perspective on a touch screen, I use assistive touch. It's my personal favorite for things like shortcuts, things, things that I do all the time, taking a screenshot. It reduces the amount of movement I have to make to get that task done. If you're using a Chrome operating system, there are also tons of accommodations that you could utilize for yourself, increasing the size of items, having it speak to you, adjusting the mouse cursor side, size. And I think um, especially as you're noticing fatigue set in, that's a really great time to jump in and use those accommodations that are, again, built in. And, and I think the reason is that we know a lot of times small changes can make a really big effect, right? Even just flipping the background color and flipping the text color when you're working on a document, right? Using a filter, making your mouse larger. Um, and, and again, you know, it might be that what you need is to just use some of these changes after lunch when our eyes and our hands and our backs and our necks are starting to tire, all right? And it might be that a small change that just reminds you that you've got to go and grab a drink of water. That's a good movement change, right? Just to be able to say, okay, I gotta take a second. I've been talking a while. I'm gonna just take a sip of water, which again, got me moving to go grab my glass, but also hydration can definitely help as well. And then uh, one of the other mouse things that I love is that um, mouse target for finding your mouse, because after a while, the, those mice kind of disappear on the screen. And having that target, um, up here when uh, when you just can't find the mouse anymore is another kind of handy um, adjustment that you can make. Absolutely and um, we, we definitely wanted to be um, agents of practicing what we preach. Um, we've been kind of jumping through slides. Uh, Judy, do we want to do it? Do we want to show a little bit of it? What's our thought on time-wise? I think we probably ought to move ahead. We have another stretch break in the middle but I would encourage all of you to honor, honor your nervous system. If we were doing this conference webinar live, we would be encouraging you to stand and shift just like you would typically do at a conference or in your classroom. So please go ahead and stretch, but this stretch is available to you so that you can take a look at that and, and, uh, and do it um, along with anyone that you are interacting with. So let's just kind of move forward a little bit. Oh, my aching neck. You sometimes feel like this flamingo that your neck has been twisted and curled all up. 
So we're going to take a look at the next slide and, and see if we can come up with some things that will help you off. First of all, a lot of you are dealing with phone calls. And um, even though we know better, there are still some of us that are putting our phone against um, our neck and, and craning our neck over because we're also trying to type or write or take notes. Um, so the things to think about are setting your phone against something to free your hands. I, we've got a pattern for you in the um, wakelet for the, um, the Eileen that uh, Therese Wilcombe has done, and you can make it in a miniature version to set your phone in. There's even on Instructables a way of making a phone holder out of a um, styrofoam cup, the way, the way you notch it and slide it in. Um, do not cradle your phone between your ear and your shoulder. Use a headset or headphones. Use your speaker feature, or again, make your own. Make your own phone stand. Um, next. So document holders. A lot of us may be um, word processing. We may be um, typing things um, as we are speaking or conferencing, or even if we're preparing uh, lessons and activities. Uh, one of the things that makes it a lot easier on the neck is to have a document holder. And it's just to move the document for better viewing at angle and distance. Um, many times when we have our documents resting flat, or even if we're copying from one screen to another and the iPad is, is sitting flat and then the, the monitor is upright, we're having to do a lot of tracking, we're moving our heads. Um, for those of us that have short-term memory issues, we're doing a lot more movement than we need to because we can't remember what we were gonna write down. So some of the solutions that you can think about are very, very cheap and dirty. You can take tape the document to the side of your screen. You can Velcro clothespins to the side of your screen and then put the document in the clothespins. And you can even create a, a document holder from a styrofoam cup. Or just tilt it or lean it against something that is somewhat in a vertical plane. Next. So we're gonna talk about your hands, your wrists, and your fingers. If you're using a dining room table to allow um, for adequate workspace for your computer monitor and laptop, use a blanket or a towel to pad the heart or the sharp surface. I don't know about you, but I have had um, really bruised and sore wrists, and they weren't the sore wrists that we're commonly associated with the, the carpal tunnel. Um, it isn't from bending my wrist back or bending my wrist excessively forward, it's from resting my wrist on the edge of the table or resting my wrist on the edge of the, um, of the laptop. And they've gotten so sore, I couldn't even figure it out for a while until I kind of looked down and I realized that I'm pressing against as I'm typing. And so um, putting a blanket or, or something to cushion and not using those wrist rests, those are really bad for you, but just something to cushion your wrist from the sharp edges of a table or a, a laptop. And then again, using a seat pillow or a blanket to elevate the body so your surface is slightly below and you can access your, um, your keyboard without resting your hands on your keyboard. So the next slide. So keyboard and mice. Um, the, the, your keyboard, ideally, when you can, and if, if you have an external keyboard, it really comes in handy, but it should be at the lap level so that your arms are tilted slightly downward when using the keyboard. Um, if your keyboard, and, your keyboard and mouse should be positioned to allow the elbows close enough to the body and the arms at or above 90 degrees. Um, also that proximal stability that we want to talk about so we're not having to hold our arms up. If you can have the, um, the monitor or the keyboard or the mouse or whatever you're using at a position where you can rest your arms on a surface instead of hold them above a surface, um, you're not going to become so tired and, so, and you're not going to have the neck and pain, back pain. Um, you also want to place your keyboard and mouse close enough so the device can be reached comfortably. You don't want your mouse at the edge of a table. So next slide. The next slide is me, but I, Judy, I want to jump back for a second because Lisa asked, why are wrist rests bad? Often the wrist rests are bad because they're causing us to cock our wrist excessively up or down. And really your wrists need to be in neutral. You don't want them bent. You want them resting in neutral so the fingers kind of drop on the keyboard instead of cocking them up and then using your keyboard. Alyssa talked about force 
And Alyssa, if you want to add to my comments, that would be great. Yeah, and I think it is really, Lisa, I feel like it's about about that force because i think we we think oh there's a wrist rest there great my wrist is in a great spot and i think we end up you know putting more pressure there and extending our wrists more than than we really think we're going to um and i think being able to you know making sure that that we uh you know we we make sure we're not putting that extra pressure on when we're wanting our wrist to be in neutral it ends up kind of giving you a, a dip in that neutrality to where you're really resting your wrist instead of you know you're pressing your wrist with force instead of resting it but i mean Mia, it was asking about standing at a standing desk and it really depends on your setup mia because i think one of the early slides showed a gentleman standing in the kitchen um and the, the monitor or the laptop or the iPad was at eye level and then there was an external keyboard. When you can't do that, there are some other ways that you can try to adjust by folding your laptop way back and then having some support to contact the keyboard while still having the monitor at an appropriate angle. Alyssa, do you have anything to add to that in no, terms that's, of standing? that's great. And, and Mia, you can always send me a picture of that standing desk and we can kind of problem solve if need be. Um, one of the extensions I wanted to mention, because sometimes both either for you or for your students, the custom cursors that are available in Microsoft or in other operating, operating systems, um, they just don't, you know, they're not enough. They're not right. We can't find the right one. Um, so this is an extension called Custom Cursor. It's where my little finger pointing cursor came from that you can see on the screen. Um, and sometimes it's, you know, it's, it helps me to be able to figure out where it is because it's a lot larger and longer. It also helps in training and in digital work because I can come and point and say, you know, here is the web address. Um, and it changes to a fun little like book stack with apples on it. Um, but definitely checking out the cursor options that are there um, as you're mousing because then you're, you're doing less movement to find the mouse and chances are you're less likely to put yourself in an awkward situation while you're you know you're moving your mouse and you've got your body in an awkward spot um i love the comments that are happening in the chat box there's some great stuff uh great stuff coming through um just really quickly talking about um alternate positions we know that a lot of times um you know you you don't have a perfect setup so trying to find some other ways to be creative in how we are positioning ourselves so working from the floor some of us do, and you see that picture she set up really pretty nicely. Some of us don't. And so thinking about working from the floor, make sure you can get up. If you can't get up, maybe that's not your best position. The other thing is, I know we're laughing here. Um, the other thing is to make sure that you've identified a space to work where you're not constantly going to be stepped on, where you're out of uh, range of cords and different things. You want to make sure that you've got a nice firm seat and that you're supporting your back. Um, I'm not going to uh, go into a lot of detail. You can review the slides at your leisure, but you see that she's got some support under her, her bottom. She's got um, some lumbar support. She's using the wall for her upper back support. Her laptop is being raised up by her bent knees. And if I were her, I would probably even put something under my knees. And we're going to talk about that on the next slide. And then making sure, taking a break, stretching a leg out, uh, shifting um, on the, the seat cushions, whatever. OK, next slide. So work while, while reclining. Somebody brought this up in, in the chat a little earlier. We know that we got a lot of um, teens, as well as ourselves, or anybody, um, laying down to work on their um, on their iPads or their phones, probably more than a laptop, but I have seen people laying back with their laptops too. Again, we want to support the back um, and probably flat is not the ideal position uh, for anyone. There are over the bed and over the whatever you're using um, uh, monitor holders. So if, if that is the position of choice or the position of necessity, there are um, external ones, but I wouldn't recommend jury rigging one up. That's something I think a little bit more specialized. But start by building up continuous support from the hips through the shoulder blades. Um, you can use that roll towels or wedges. Elevate the knees so that you've got leg support. 
um, use a laptop tray or a firm surface and position the screen as close to eye level as possible. Um, Kathy has given us some good suggestions about what that eye level really means in the chat. And also make sure that you're not resting um, your laptop on something soft. You wanna allow your fan um, in the laptop um, to circulate and you don't wanna overheat your battery. Next slide. Working on the couch. Um, this is a do as I say, not as I, uh, uh, the picture indicates there. Uh, as you can see, she's all kind of out of, out of whack in terms of her position and my neck hurts just looking at her propping on her elbows and trying to do all of that. So again, you wanna support the back. Um, the optimal uh, posture is to work slightly reclined, but then have cushions. And you can either do that by being um, sideways on the sofa or you can do it by um, having your back against the back cushions and then having your feet on something else. Again, uh, raising the laptop via bent knees so that the screen is closer to eye level or the, um, the iPad is closer to eye level. Put um, whatever you're using, monitor, um, on a cushion or a wedge and take breaks. So we're going to transition a little and talk for the last couple of minutes um, and hopefully have a minute or two for questions um, just about about some other interventions that you can put in place. Um, and I specifically wanted this graphic here because I think that that uh, parallel of or, or metaphor of making sure that you're putting your oxygen mask on before you're helping your kids applies to this time period right now, making sure yourself is in a yourself is in a good spot and then making sure you can help either the kids that you're working with or your own kids in your house. We want to make Absolutely. sure we're modeling. Yeah. So Go ahead. you want to model what you want your students to do and you want to narrate it so they understand, oh, I'm going to put this cushion behind my back. I'm going to be um, taking a 20 minute stretch break. I'm going to drink some water. This ensures that learning of useful strategies that helps develop good work habit, minimizes risks, um, teaches good work, set up and again it is um, implied instead of explicit and sometimes that internalizes a lot better than telling people what to do. Right. So these are some some um, pictures of some stretch breaks again we were hoping we could do them but we have been chatting and we want to get on to some case studies. So this information is in the wakelet and you can look at these. These are sheets that you can um, print and send home. Perfect. So a couple of other um, extensions that might be helpful. Um, healthy browsing is one that I use. You'll see you can set it to give you a blinking reminder, that eye break, a water reminder, a stretch reminder, and a posture reminder, and you can have it play a sound or not, okay? Um, if you're familiar with uh, the Calm app or have used it for other things, this is a link to the Calm extension that really is a good, nice break. It also allows you to uh, kind of force block other sites until a specific thing is done. Um, so being able to like force yourself to not go to Gmail and do this break first. Um, and one of the things that's important to remember is that we know that everybody's stress level is higher. So we know the whole self spider, we, we, our muscles just kind of live in active mode. Um, and absolutely, a global pandemic is a very logical reason to be stressed. We're new, using new software, we're in new work environments, we're jumping between sometimes three and four platforms in a meeting. Um, and we know that drains you from an executive functioning perspective that can cause stress. And, and just to be mindful of that, it's another reason why those breaks are so critically important. Um, a couple of you kind of sent in um, some pictures and we wanted to kind of just give an opportunity in the chat box or if you want to turn mics on, um, just to give us a couple of ideas now that we have gone through all these things of some things that you feel like maybe could be changed. Uh, we have two pictures of the first one, so I'm gonna go to this one. So this picture we looked at before, um, drop in the chat box a couple quick things that could be done to change the positioning or make the situation more ergonomic. Somebody's gotta have a something. Everybody got quiet. 
the cat needs to go. <laughs> oh. um, right, definitely trying to find a way to to raise the raise the uh, the monitor. Maybe use an external mouse. Um, maybe have that laptop be a little bit higher. Um, absolutely, yeah. Look at the light that's coming in from the window. Those are all really great things. And use one of those pillows. Maybe not ripping it out from underneath the cat. But use one of those pillows to to help you kind of figure out how could you how could you do that. So what about this setup? Something a little bit familiar in terms of still a couch, but a little bit different. Um, a little bit. Do you think everything? Do you think everything's within reach? Have they thought of everything so that they have everything right at their fingertips? Yeah, maybe some pillows to prop on the couch, Mia. Yeah, Bill, good question. Where does the mouse go in this setup? Are they mousing just on the laptop? And yeah, Mia, move that table over so it's like it's it's a little bit more accessible. Um, yeah, I'm not a huge fan of extended work on trackpads. I think it leads to some of those problems we've talked about for sure. Um, Look at the recline level of the sofa. Do you think that's, that's a good stable sitting position? Lots of examples and ideas coming in. Um, yeah, Mia, track pads are good for short, short use, but it puts us in a really awkward position long term. Um, but being able to make some changes in terms of writing, yep, the lighting I think is pretty good. There's nothing glaring. Um, and and absolutely, I think you're going to have some back um, some back aches just from sitting in that chair because it doesn't have a lot of lumbar support, right? Um, let's jump to. I'm going to jump through because of time. So a couple of final points, real quick, um, just to make sure that um, you know ergonomic stuff is great as long as we're using it correctly. Um, we want to make sure that that's, that workspace, whatever space you have now, is dedicated to work as much as possible. You have a comfortable chair, you're using a keyboard and mouse, as external if at all possible, and you've given yourself some postural support. Go ahead, Judy, with the rest of it. Uh, we just want to reduce repetitive movements, awkward postures, and static forces. Again, use what you've got, but also think ahead. Plan ahead, take five minutes at the beginning of the day, decide where you're going to work, decide what you're going to need, uh, make sure that it's safe in terms of wires and cords and everything else, and uh, it's going to save you a lot of time in the long run. Um, and just a couple of, of quick re resources. So these are two um, infographics that we've made, um, just to kind of, one is a little bit more on the book cover play, um, and one is some, some good ergonomic practices. I actually made the one on the left, one of my uh, desktop monitor uh, display pictures so that I remember. Um, but just if you need an extra visual, um, the pictures are there and then these actually link to the PDF um, in Google Drive for you. Um, in terms of other resources, remember you have the link to the Wakelet. It has all of these and more. Um, kind of divide and when Mike sends out the recording he's also going to send out a, a couple of extra links with it as well. All right Judy we made it almost in an hour. Thank you so very much for joining us. Uh, there were a couple questions on whether this is going to be repeated. If there's um, a, a request I think we could probably repeat it. Um, it has been recorded. Please follow us on, on Twitter um, and use our emails. Um, we have been very, very um, grateful for Mike's support and also for your support, both in terms of uh, spreading the word about this workshop and um, for um, joining us today and participating so, so much. Yeah, absolutely. Again, you'll see the link to the slides right there. Um, I'm happy to stick out, stick around um, and we can answer any questions if you guys want to turn on your cameras and audio and, and ask that question. Um, you know, so and I and I will make sure I've saved the chat. So I'm going to go back through it and make sure if we didn't address a specific question that we do. Um, I do Jennifer have some ideas for standing desks that aren't $9,000. Um, so I can I can get some of that information out to you guys as well. 
Um, so anybody have any questions um, that they want to kind of drop in the chat box? Or like I said, if you want to turn your microphone on, camera on, and we can chat face to face, I'm happy to do that as well as I think Judy as well. So, but if not, we are really grateful that you joined us. Um, uh, we're hoping at some point we may end up doing kind of a part two that looks at students. But when we thought about what's the critical need right now, it's how do we help get some good information in your hands to, to, uh, to really uh, change, make the changes you can given the situation that we're in. And keep those cards and letters coming. Keep chatting. Question? Yes, go for it. Um, so I work in a mental health clinic and people are complaining vigorously. Is this something I can share with other people or is this yours? No, absolutely. Please share. Okay. Okay. Thank you so much. They will be thrilled. Thank you. Wendy, ideas to reduce shoulder pain. I think probably take a look at what your shoulders are doing. And that might give you some ideas. Look at your armrests. Look and see whether you are in chicken wing position, as I call it, where your arms are extended out and your elbows are, are bent um, perpendicular to your body. And see if you can work with your, um, with your shoulders relaxed and your arms closer to your body. Um, Alyssa, what do you suggest? Yeah, and I think sometimes it comes back to that chair positioning, getting yourself as much support as possible you know, in your chair so that you're not having to either do that lean or, you know, maybe it comes down to your keyboard needing to be repositioned so you aren't having to reach at an awkward angle or type at an awkward angle. Um, and, and remember, anything we do for a sustained time is putting our body in an awkward spot. You know, if you do a lot of mousing, I see a lot of people who use the keyboard tray for their keyboard, but they put their mouse up on top of their desk. So every time they have to mouse or adjust, they're going back down and adjusting. And so sometimes it's a little change like that, that you wouldn't think it's directly affecting your shoulders, but it's about playing detective a little bit to figure out, okay, what motion am I doing that's really hurting me? And Bill has brought up um, in the chat, and a number of people seem to agree that um, the monitor position does also affect your shoulders because the monitor kind of directs where your, your head and your eyes are going and your neck and then your shoulders are following because you're directing your arms to contact the keyboard. Yeah, and one of the things I discovered just a little bit into this working from home is that I thought I had a pretty good ergonomic setup, but I was looking just slightly down and it was just an angle of maybe five or 10 degrees, but it was enough that every time I went to PT, she's like, what's bothering you? And I'm like, the shoulders, the neck, the traps, the everything up here. Um, so I already had a mount for my double monitors, but it was not at the right height. So making that, that small, small shift of height has made a world of difference so that I am looking at things at an even level and not doing this little tilt downward for my shoulders. And then also taking a look at your stress level, as, as Alyssa alluded to at the beginning, when we are tense when we're uptight we hold ourselves rigidly and and it's harder for us to move in a, a relaxed and a, a a calm manner and i think again learning how to uh, provide services from a distance has been stressful um, we can't unsee some of the things that we see on the screen we have people who are upset we have um, uh, it's a it's a new learning curve and so it is very hard the first um, the first conference I did um, after all of this happened I found my 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 sit bones my tailbone was really sore and when I analyzed it I thought oh my gosh I was leaning forward I was so worried about um, uh, catching everything all the information I was supposed to be catching I was really shifting in a way that I was putting my weight right over my tailbone and I was so uncomfortable um, I felt like I'd been horseback riding for a month. So kind of think about that, about, about how stressed we have become um, these days and try to figure out ways that you can um, de-stress yourselves a little bit as well as um, thinking about your position. Great, I'm trying to see if there are any other big questions in the chat box, not seeing them. Um, does anybody else have a question they need to turn microphones on and ask? Mike, you got any questions? 
No, but I have my microphone on. No, this was awesome. It was really good. I, I learned a ton. I've modified some things at my desk while I was sitting here. And them <laughs> well, we're going to have to take another picture. I'll have to do it. I can't do it now. There's way too many post-it notes everywhere. It looks like a complete disaster. Oh, you don't, you want, you don't want to see my post-it note, note land. It looks like I killed a forest of post-it notes on yeah, my desk. It's, it's not good. <laughs> <laughs> but I love you guys for still embracing paper. You know, some of my friends are no paper ever. And sometimes paper is the best. Yeah, you got to use the tool that meets the job. And sometimes I need that paper right in front of me, even if I could type during a during a webinar, I need the like the post it note that reminds me to turn my closed captions on at the top before I start. That's right. If I had that note. up on the computer, it would yep. not have reminded me. I have it stuck to I have two post it notes stuck to my computer. Now the closed caption and record button. And then the other is the keyboard commands for Zoom to get in and out of the audio and to show the chat. Yep, Ooh, those are really important. I need to learn those. Keyboard, keyboard shortcuts are your friend as long as you don't overuse them so that you're doing way more keyboarding. Um, you know, and then it goes back to the force, yeah. Yep, repetition and force and posture. They aren't all your friends if you overuse them. All right, it looks like your your pictures are, uh, I mean, your, I saw Lisa say picture. It looks like your questions are winding down. Uh, final call for questions. And you guys have our email addresses. You have our Twitter handles. Feel free to reach out. I know a number of you sent some pictures in um, that show up in the slides, but we kind of, uh, for sake of time, skip through some of them. So I'll go back through and, and uh, make sure I reply to the, those of you who sent some pictures with some quick ideas that hit me off the top of my head um, if you haven't already come up with them through our conversation. Ellen, did you have something else? It's silly, but should I email you? I can't figure out how to share it. Oh, don't apologize for being silly. It's it's not silly at all. Yeah, you can absolutely email that. that we're okay, happy, thank you. Happy, more than happy to talk with you about email. It was great. Thank you so much. You're welcome. You. Glad it was helpful. Thanks, Alan. Right. Kelly, you have nothing to say? I'm so surprised. You did it. You, you, Maybe you. she's gone. Kelly, oh, are yeah, you still she's there? still there. Maybe she just are turned it on and walked away. That's true. She's no. sleepy down low. <laughs> nah, she's riding the, she's riding the chat box. <laughs> yeah. Oh, I see. I see the chat. I see the chat. No, Mike, I'm rolling to hang out and see if anybody has questions. If not, I mean, I think we've exhausted. I've, I know I'm exhausted. I don't know if we've exhausted them with all the thoughts. Yeah, right. Maybe, I can't yeah. wait to read Honestly. everything in the chat box. Yeah, the chat oh, box. Oh, man, it's great. fantastic, Judy. It's, it's very good, very good chats happening. I'm so glad. I don't think, I don't know if Kathy's still in here, but I'm so glad Kathy Stern popped in. Oh, she is. Oh, yep. She's still there. Thank you, Kathy. Yes, please go take a break from your computer, go walk around your house or outside if it's lovely like it is here in Florida, stretch, get some water. It's definitely time after sitting for an hour, which hopefully you took some breaks during that hour, but. We at least know you took one 20 second eye break. <laughs> yes, we, we got a 20 second eye break in there. And a quick head, shoulders, knees and toes for those that sang. Yeah. And, and I didn't sing intentionally because nobody needs to hear that on a recording. Well, nobody needed to hear me either. And I forgot to do the motion, so whatever. <laughs> but most people did the motions along with you from what I saw in the chat box. Some of it was just innately built in. If you've ever done any time in a pre-K setting, you just, as soon as you hear the words, your hands start going up. Hi, oh, yes, I could, Kelly, but I won't. Hey, Bill. How are you? I'm good. Oh, I forgot to show everybody. I had my OT t-shirt on because we were talking about OT. There. Uh, ah. nice. So I just wanted to, to let people know we're talking about the expensive stand-up desks. So I actually, you can, if you have room, right? Like, let's say you have more room than you have money. Uh, I actually made a workbench just out of two by fours and stuff with a, 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 a door top and I made it standing height. And then I just bought 
one of the stools, one of the ergonomic stools that goes up in that standing high standing high stool height. that you can just pull up. I have well, a, a nice. I have a, a eye height desk that I can stand at, and if I really want to sit, I pull over the stool. It's right. a much less expensive way to be standing height, right? Right, absolutely. Oh, yeah. I've seen, I've seen that, you know, I don't happen to be one of those people that has loads of extra wood sitting around my house, but um, I've also seen Amazon, they probably are ridiculously expensive right now, but they have made some cardboard ones that I, I think, you know, in a pinch, we could fabricate something out of, out of cardboard that would absolutely do the standing height. Um, and there are a couple other ones you don't need the super fancy touch the little lever and they automatically rise. You know, yeah. especially for, you know, just using it as a position change. If you're not using it as your everyday workstation to do all your work at. Yeah. Well, well I meant to bring up, Go ahead. I meant to bring up that Chris Bouguet and, and uh, Karen Dietrich from our AT team, every time we had a meeting, in fact, I never saw Chris sit after, after uh, we first started uh, talking about standing desks. They would actually go into any meeting and they take the recycle bin from the from the corner of the classroom and they turn that upside down and put their laptop up there and then have their keyboard below so that works real well too yeah. the blue recycle bins you guys did awesome by the way i love your presentation thank you thank you I mean, i'm actually really impressed because that back and forth each of you takes a turn is very very hard to do well so you guys did awesome <laughs> well this organized it very nicely for us so, and I think part of it is, so I've learned this doing presentations with other people. I put bitmojis in the bottom corner of whose turn it is on the slide. And oh, it, that's helps, a good idea. it helps tremendously because then even if I thought I knew what it was, then I can go back and be like, oh no, wait, that's Judy's slide. Shut your mouth, stop talking, <laughs> you know, and it's nice yeah, yeah. to know, you know, so that it does, it does help. But Judy made it easy to co-present with her. And Bill, we have haven't forgotten we would really like to to do something with lesson picks with this too um i wanted to uh to make some uh reminders for kids i just haven't had time i've been painting like I, i'm covered with paint um good uh, but we, uh, i when think when are we going to do the art kit aren't we going to build the well, art kit I, live i've been waiting